Good afternoon. I'm Ruthie Zell with 9PBS. Thanks for joining us for this debate among the four candidates for St. Louis mayor in the nonpartisan primary a week from today. Andrew Jones, Tashara Jones, Kara Spencer, and Lewis Reed will be taking questions from our debate partners. Rachel Lipman from St. Louis Public Radio and Casey Nolan from Five on Your Side. We also will include questions sent in by voters. This one hour debate has a simple format. There will be one minute opening statements followed by questions. The candidates will each have one minute to answer. Then there will be time for follow up questions from the panelists. Five on your side, Casey Nolan will start things off. Okay, thank you, Ruth. And thank you to all of those who have joined us. Thank you to the candidates. Uh, I guess, first of all, we should say, if it's not already obvious, like so much of uh, life these days, this is on Zoom for COVID safety, but with Zoom comes technical difficulty sometimes. So we'll ask in advance for your forgiveness and your patience. If somebody drops out or if there's some issues, we're going to keep going, but we will work to get people back and get it connected, just like your, your meetings, perhaps, uh, that you've had through Zoom yourselves. Uh, I, first, I will introduce the candidates and then we'll do some opening statements. And we're gonna start uh, with the introductions and those statements, just like you will see their names listed on the ballot one week from today, if you can believe it's already here. So starting off, uh, the president of the board of aldermen, Lewis Reed. Mr. Reed, just give us a, a wave, because not we, we can't assume everybody knows everybody by face. Uh, and we're at the mercy of Zoom here with the things popping up and down on the windows. Uh, Alderwoman from the 20th Ward, Kara Spencer. Treasurer of the city of St. Louis, Tashara Jones, and utility executive, Mr. Andrew Jones. All right, we have our candidates, we have our clock running. So we'll start uh, again with opening statements. One minute, please. And we will stick with uh, that order as well. So Mr. Reed, I will turn it over to you first for your opening statement, please, sir. Okay, thanks uh, to today's hosting organization. You know, personal setbacks and tragedies I've experienced led me to public service. You know, I remember praying over my brother's body after he was shot and killed. So I know what hopelessness feels like and the pain countless families live through each year. In high school, I was homeless, but a tough wrestling coach refused to give up on me and I earned a college scholarship. So I know Every child can achieve great things given the right opportunities and support. As your mayor, I won't give up on a single person. Economic recovery from COVID, safer neighborhoods, access to quality education. Together, we will build a stronger, safer, more unified St. Louis. I'm Lewis Reed, and I'm asking for your vote on March 2nd. Thank you, Mr. Reed. We appreciate it. Alderwoman Spencer, you're next up. Opening statement, one minute, please. Thank you so much, Casey. <clears throat> my name is Kara Spencer, and since my first day on the Board of Aldermen, I have stood up for everyday St. Louisans. I passed legislation reigning in the predatory payday lending industry, came down hard on absentee landlords, and I led the fight against the special interests trying to privatize our airport. But I know too well the issue that the next mayor needs to tackle first, and that's violence. My life changed forever when a gun was put to my head, but I'm still here. The young man behind the gun, however, lost his life that night to incarceration. We have to get serious about guns and the violence destroying our community. Our city has failed us, but if I'm elected mayor, I will tackle issues like crime, poverty, and racial disparities with the same energy and the same solution-oriented focus that I brought to the table when I relentlessly fought airport privatization. We are a phenomenal city on the biggest, mightiest river in our nation with the best zoo, the best baseball team, and the best people. I'm running for mayor to lead our city in a new direction and make St. Louis what it can be. Thanks for having me today. Thank you, Alder Woman. Treasurer Tashara Jones, opening statement, one minute, please. Yes, thank you for having us today. I'm Treasurer Tashara Jones, and I use the She Series pronouns. Since I began my career as a public servant, I've worked to make sure that the St. Louis we hand over to the next generation isn't as broken as the one we inherited. And that means confronting the harsh realities of our past and saying yes to the brighter opportunities of our future. See, I'm committed to making something that we can all hold, touch, see, and feel. Instead of saying no to opportunity, change, innovation, and equitable growth, let's try saying yes. So we're not a poor city. 
We are a cheap city because we have refused to invest in what will move our city forward. You should be able to succeed here regardless of your skin color, who you love, how you worship, your zip code, or any identity you hold. I want to build a city where each and every one of you feels welcome. And I know that we can do that together. So on March 2nd, say yes to Tashara Jones for mayor of the city of St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer. Now, Mr. Jones, opening statement, one minute, please. I'd like to introduce myself to some, present myself to others. My name is Andrew Jones, utility executive for over 25 years and been in the utility business for 40 years. I am like most of you, I'm frustrated by what has been happening with the political base here in the city of St. Louis and where it's led our city. Four years ago, I talked about we were at a crossroads. Today, I'm saying we're at a point of no return. We have to do something about it. And I feel duty bound to be that example that brings in a certain set of skills excellent skills in solving problems, turning around organizations, turning around departments, making sure that we move in the right direction, but also being focused on those things that need to be changed. And I've been consistent across the board in having them highlighted in my platform. My, again, my name is Andrew Jones. I'm looking forward to becoming your next mayor. Vote for me, March 2nd. All right, thank you to all four of you. Uh, one little bit of housekeeping as we get into the question portion, if you don't mind when you're not speaking like a meeting, maybe mute yourself so we can have uh, a clear opportunity to hear the person who is speaking. We're gonna talk about a lot of issues today that are facing the city of St. Louis. And as Ruth said at the top, we've got some questions we've heard from our viewers and listeners as well that we wanna get to you. Uh, let's start though, I'm gonna to toss it over to Rachel to start things off again. Each candidate will have one minute to respond and then we'll have some follow-up afterwards. Rachel, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Casey. And like he mentioned, this first question, candidates, is for all of you. And we'll go in that ballot order for this first one. In individual interviews, you've all spoken about the number one issue facing the city being the historically high rates of crime, especially violent crime. And you've all talked to some degree about long range plans to deal with this, you know, over time. But what specifically would you do in the near term immediately to stop the loss of life? And President Reed, we'll start with you. One minute. So uh, thanks for the question, Rachel. When you look at uh, the number of closed cases that we have on an annual basis, uh, on an annual year, we are only seeing about 30% of the murder cases being closed, which means that 70% of the people who have committed murders in our city are never ever uh, faced any repercussions, did not have to face trial. So, and if you talk to law enforcement or the courts, one of the things they say is people aren't coming forward. So last, at the end of the year, I put in place the Justice for Families Fund, which partners to bring, uh, to increase the reward fund so that we can have people come forward in a total anonymous fashion and we can get to the bottom of some of these closed cases. We also rolled out Cure Violence. So the expansion of Cure Violence was certainly helped within certain neighborhoods all across the city of St. Louis. But we're going to have to uh, invest our way out of this issue. It's not one that we're going to purely arrest our way out of it. We're going to have to have multiple things operating all at once and working with the police department. Thank you, President Reed, for that answer. Alderwoman Spencer, how would you address the issue in immediately to stop the loss of life? Sure, Rachel, this is so important. While long-term solutions are incredibly important, we have to address crime now. We have had rewards uh, available to folks for years. This isn't working. When I launched this campaign, I went to the other cities across the United States where uh, cities are successfully addressing violence, and they are, and look to those cities, uh, to the experts involved in reducing crime there. I said, what are we doing? Um, and it's clear there is there are programs that are working very well in other cities. And if elected mayor, I will bring focus deterrence to the city of St. Louis. Uh, this is a data-driven approach that has been successful in cities that look very similar to St. Louis. We will take the Teneo report that was commissioned by Civ uh, Civic Progress and some of those members and address the deficiencies within city uh, within our city police department, including a lack of a strategy for dealing with violence, a lack of a communication protocol for sharing intelligence and uh, some of the inefficiencies within our police department. These strategies 
uh, can start to reduce violence on day one. Thank you, Alderwoman. Spencer, uh, Treasurer Tashara Jones, how would you tackle the immediate issue of loss of life? Yes, I'm glad to see that uh, focus deterrence is something that's supported by the Alderwoman because that was in my original platform in 2017 when I ran for mayor. Um, you know, the one thing that I've also seen uh, as we talk to other cities who've already been here is that we have to bring everybody to the table because crime just doesn't stop at Skinker Boulevard or the Mississippi River. So that means engaging our partners to the West and to the East uh, to come to to come together to the table with uh, active strategies to reduce crime uh, and also to address uh, our, our current situation because crime uh, affects all of us, whether we live in St. Louis City, St. Louis County or St. Clair County or Jefferson County. So we need to bring everyone to the table with, uh, with a strategy forward to address crime uh, as a region, not just as a city of St. Louis, because we are all in this together and our destinies are linked. And Andrew Jones, how would you address the immediate issue of loss of life in the city of St. Louis? Well, I get paid to solve problems and not to hem and haw and to put up straw man concepts. What we're going to do is utilize the professional men and women in the police department who know how to do their job. They've been comprehensively trained, even though they're seeking additional training to allow them to get rid of, ladies and gentlemen, those very small number of people who are selling drugs and narcotics, who are criminal elements, who commit 80% of the violent crime in the city of St. Louis, 80% of the homicides in the city of St. Louis, you solve the problem by getting rid of the problem. And so my number one focus will be to assign our police who know who these criminals are to get them off the street so that other law abiding citizens will be able to be able to make sure that they take care of their citizenship rights and be able to freely move around the city without being hampered and being ca uh, captive in their homes. Mr. Jones, I, I want to follow up very quickly with that. You, you've said this several times now, especially in the Politically Speaking podcast, that, you know, the police department knows who these violent individuals are and they're not being arrested. And you know that because there's been an increase in violent crime. Do you have any concrete proof beyond that correlation that the police are not arresting known violent criminals? All, all one has to do is look at the data from the information that's there. Even though they may not compile those specific numbers, but if you put things together, you can see the absolute nexus between what has happened with these violent crimes, with people getting shot, they're killing children, and they're not taking money from them. But if you sit back and talk to the police, they will tell you that there is an absolute nexus between these people. We do all of the intelligence-led policing. They have all the data. They know who these people are, but now they're handcuffed, no pun intended, to be able to go out and execute the arrest. And I think everyone is keeping that out of their mind, that you have to go out and arrest the people who are killing people. Yes, we understand that, Mr. Jones. But again, yes or no, do you have proof beyond a correlation in the rise in crime that police are being told, do not arrest these individuals? Where is your well, proof for that? The, the proof of that is deductive reasoning because they're not effectively going out. If they know who these police are, and this is about thinking again, if you deductively reason and inductively reason that the police aren't doing anything, they know who these people are, they can't arrest those who are getting off freely, that means leadership is not saying anything and they're not even out front. So I would deduce that as well. If you don't hear from them, if they're not directing the department that they control, I think anyone can see that. Let me bring the other three of you in. Mr. Reed, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I have a rebuttal to all the woman Spencer. Uh, she referenced uh, my program to provide greater reward funds and she said it does not work. I would draw her attention to Kansas City and also draw her attention to Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, Nebraska was experiencing a 60% closure rate, which is twice the closure rate that we're experiencing here in the city of St. Louis. They said that it was not enough and they needed a greater closure rate on murder cases. They increased their reward fund and saw their closure rate go up to over 90%. So uh, it has worked in cities all across America. Uh, we need to provide put things in place that work, not hopes and dreams and things that we just make up, but things that have been vetted and proven to work in other cities across this nation. And this, this one works. 
Okay. Mr. Reed, real quickly, though, I just wanted to clarify one thing. I'm looking now, and it does not appear that your Justice for St. Louis Families Fund passed in this session. Are you referring to something, a different specific fund that you've done in the past, or uh, no, we passed this specific it at, fund? Yeah, we passed it at the Board of ENA. So we adopted it at the Board of ENA and entered into a MOU. So uh, we don't have to do it through the Board of Aldermen. We did it through the Board of ENA, through an MOU. I'll Rich, bring in the that, older woman since you were mentioned. Yeah, there. That, ahead, that, that issue did come before the board of aldermen. The president proposed a two million dollar budget to increase uh, the the victims' funds. Look, the 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 program uh, does have some level of success. They've issued about fifteen to thirty thousand dollars a year in in rewards, um, and that's a good thing. There are that, that does help, uh, but this is not going to solve violence. Okay, we've had. Uh, we have had these rewards in place for years and funding that organization with additional $2 million is something that would fund them for the next 30 years out of our reserve fund. So look, the focus deterrence model does, as Mr. Jones point out, really focus on those individuals most at risk at being involved in violence. It's a collaborative and coordinated approach between our law enforcement, our circuit attorney, and our prosecutor's office, and those service providers that can help give folks the tools they need to turn their lives around. And of course, law enforcement is important because when they don't do that, um, it does come down hard. It is a focused approach that uh, has been very successful in other cities at not moving the needle a little bit by tremendously dropping the homicide rate and violence in communities by focusing efforts, coordinating an approach, and really delivering data, data, <laughs> data uh, results that are clear by data. I want to bring in Tashara Jones, uh, Treasurer Jones, uh, excuse me, uh, and, and again, sticking with this theme that we hear from people when we're either soliciting questions or otherwise, that is there, what is the most immediate thing we can do, or is it just not that simple? I think it's that simple. Um, you know, there are a, a whole host of organizations doing really good work in our community, uh, like President Reed talked about with Cure Violence, uh, that they're doing some really good violence interruption in the neighborhoods that they're currently in. Uh, focused deterrence could be added to the mix. Uh, it has to be, like he said, it has to be several different uh, approaches all going on at the same time because this is not a one size fit all solution. Uh, so we can bring focus deterrence in, we can continue funding cure violence, we can continue uh, outreach uh, to make sure that people are connected to uh, good paying jobs or entrepreneurship skills. Uh, we And we have to declare gun violence as a public health crisis, which brings everyone to the table, just like we did in this pandemic. So it's a myriad of things. And, and, we ha and again, as I said before, we all have to come to the table because violence doesn't stop at Skinker Boulevard on the Mississippi River. We all have to realize that our destinies are linked and shared and we have to act accordingly. Well, you've all, we've all agreed that, that we, well, hang on, we, we've all agreed that this is the number one issue. I have a feeling this will be a thread throughout the entire hour. So I want to, I want to add another question here to the mix, keep but the Casey conversation going. We've got a lot of issues we want to get to here. Casey and one of them we saw, not just in our local press, but in national press, when we had fire coming out of the windows of the downtown city jail. So I want to know, is this a human rights crisis? Is this a public safety crisis? Because I think just about everybody could agree, flames coming out of windows and People, inmates, detainees, throwing things out of windows. That is not what anybody wants. Uh, we'll just, I, I will, sticking with our list, we'll kind of jump around as we go, but I'll, I'll send it back to Alderwoman Spencer first. Human rights crisis, public safety crisis, what's going on with the city correction system? Oh, Casey, this is all of the above. It's a human rights crisis, obviously. It's a public safety crisis, and it's a crisis of leadership. When we learned that the locks on the doors in our jails are not working, this should make everyone's jaw drop. It is un inexcusable. There is no reason why we should have non-functioning locks in our maximum security jail. Uh, we, as the city of St. Louis, have now one but two jail facilities. We know this. Uh, the other one is called the workhouse. And there has been a call to close that facility for years from our activists, our advocacy, and our general population. You know, we have a human rights crisis in incar incarcerating uh, our public here for some time now. But to learn that the, the, the facility, the new 
one isn't even functioning on a very basic level, it's very clear that we need to turn our system on its head and fully re-examine what is going on there. And we need leadership that can dig in and really be very thorough in the analysis that has clearly failed to take place. And I would point to, uh, you know, the, the fact that this has been an ongoing issue known internally for some time, and it's truly horrifying, Casey, and it's, it's again, it's inexcusable. Okay, thank you very much. And again, we're sticking with one minute here for each of you, and then we'll have some discussion after. Tashara Jones, Treasurer Tashara Jones, uh, what's going on with the, the city's jails? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's deplorable the conditions that our detainees are currently in in our city in our city jails. I've been advocating for closing the workhouse since 2016, um, and also these problems at the city jail downtown are not new. Uh, uh, the uh, people who work there have been complaining uh, up the chain for uh, for months. Um, and then also, not only do the locks not work, there are overdoses within the jail, and and there's been a young man who lost his life, um, whose uh, family is crying out for answers and has not received answers for over 100 days. So this is definitely a human rights issue. We should be treating our detainees with dignity and respect, whether they are in or out of our jails. And we need to also work with the circuit attorney's office to make sure that we can uh, uh, and the judges to make sure we can get people through the system. But absolutely, you know, we have to hold everybody accountable for every piece of, of what happened at the city jail uh, just uh, uh, just last month. OK, very good. Mr. Jones, one minute. Same question. What's going on with the city jails? Willful neglect should be added to that as well as incompetence. I mentioned four years ago about the workforce and uh, workhouse and all of this and nothing was done up till today when we start this new battery of discussions, of political discussions about this, and nothing has been done concrete. If the buildings are absolutely in, inhabitable by human beings, the city has control over this. I mentioned the, in a previous forum about the overdoses. I mentioned about the death from the overdoses. This also now means that management possibly is in control of what's going on with their people that are coming in, bringing in these drugs, and that's a challenge and an issue. If we would have closed the workhouse, let people were just openly saying that we should have done, we wouldn't have any overflow capacity to handle all the other problems with detainees. They're human beings, they're, and they're detainees, but we have to move in a direction to get these things done and I'm going to do it. President Reed, same question to you, sir, the, the situation with the jails. All right, Casey, before I get to that, I wanna see if we can clear something up. What are the rules for, for uh, today's uh, debate because I thought you had, we We're have an do opportunity to respond, question. I responded, and then you gave her another opportunity to respond to my response, so then do I get another opportunity? Because otherwise, it's to everybody's With all due respect, benefit. let me tell you what the spirit of the goal here is, and that is to right. give each candidate a fair amount of time to talk. Uh, we're going to do a question, one minute response each, and then I, and I, I'll be frank with you. We're going to lean on the, the four of you to help us be equitable in the time that everyone gets to talk. So for okay, right now, so, I'll give you one minute uh, to uh, use uh, as you uh, wish. Uh, but the question on the table is, uh, what is going so, on with the city jails? Uh, before I get to that, so it's in everybody's benefit to attack someone because then they get double the time. So, so I think we politics need to look are not at that. fair. We all they, know that, I'm but not, we're going to do our best to moderate. This. I just want to make sure that we are that we're. Uh, I just want to understand the rules for engagement. Understood. Uh, Thank you, sir. All right. So, uh, before I get to that, I have to go back to the previous question. Uh, in that question, when we take a look at some of those things that can immediately get shooters off the street, and this is this is absolutely uh, one of the biggest issues for me because. I'm the person sitting here who has had a family member shot and killed and burned in a dumpster in the city of St. Louis. Uh, I'm the one that spends time with these families every year that uh, uh, that uh, have lost loved ones. So this is a very serious issue to a lot of families. And to get the shooters off the streets, the thing that we can do immediately that has worked over and over and over in other cities is to provide a mechanism for people to come forward in an anonymous fashion and give us information to lead to the, the arrest uh, of the people who have committed those shootings. Okay, 
Thank you for your response. I'll, I want to open it up to the four of you now. And you've all mentioned the workhouse to some degree. Can you briefly say, should the workhouse still be shut down, given what's going on at uh, the, the, the main jail, if you will, CJC? Mr. Jones, uh, I'll start with you. Absolutely not. As I've always stated, it's about analysis, making a determination that something needs to be done or we'll be chasing the uh, it'll be the dog chasing its tail and we'll never get anything absolutely done. We have information. We should utilize information to make the best decision so that we can come to a remedy. The workhouse has not been proven that it should be closed because of the inhumanity that might be equal uh, equited out or anything to that nature. We have to be sure in what we do and stop using red herrings as the objective to distract people from what the real goals are. Make the quick determination that the workhouse is inappropriate for human habitation and we can make the quick decision. Otherwise, it's sleight of hand. We're trying to distract people from the real issues and that is about solving problems. Problems for the city of St. Louis and the city of St. Louis moving forward is the real direction, not these other red herrings. Treasurer Jones, uh, we've been told the workhouse is more secure given the lock situation. Is this a, is this the right time to still close the workhouse? Uh, I, I still am committed to closing the workhouse, and I'll tell you why. Number one, we obviously absolutely need to uh, address the problems going on at the city jail. Uh, but as, as long as we are treating people with dignity and respect and making sure that that facility um, is, is meeting high standards um, and making sure that the pe uh, people inside aren't catching or giving each other COVID, um, we need to do a series of things to make sure that that facility uh, is well maintained um, as well as, uh, as, as, and again, as we're treating people with dignity and respect. If we were uh, constantly having those uh, that standard, uh, then we wouldn't see a riot uh, at the city jail. So we need to... Uh, uh, come back a little bit and make sure again that we are treating our detainees with uh, uh, with respect, that we are moving them through the system uh, with the help of the circuit attorney's office and the judges. And then that way, we after we uh, get this uh, situation uh, resolved, then we can close the workhouse. I'm, I pause because I think I'm talking too much now, but we'll just, just to kind of uh, tidy this quickly, uh, uh, Alderwoman Spencer, close the workhouse, yes or no, right now, given what's going on? Sure. You know, I am still committed to joining the rest of the nation and becoming a one incarceration uh, facility city. No one could have imagined how dysfunctional our incarceration facilities at, are, uh, and certainly that came to light in the last couple of weeks, as, as we just talked about. Um, but this also points to the need for for reform and how we are incarcerating individuals. It points to the need for a full scale evaluation of our processes, our procedures, and, and what is actually going on there. So I think 
uh, unfortunately, the dysfunction of the CJC really points to the need for us to look at that. We have to remember this is a fiscal issue too, Casey. Um, every person that's housed in either one of our facilities is either a state or federal prisoner and somebody that's held on those charges. And we are only reimbursed a fraction of what it costs to house those individuals. We are subsidizing this for both the state and federal governments, and it's costing us millions of dollars. We need to review those contracts uh, with those entities and make sure we are being fiscally responsible for our to our taxpayers. And, and I do believe that the closure of one of those can get us closer to a net neutral uh, uh, a fiscal investment in both and, and be more humane in the process to the folks that we're housing. Mr. Reed, close the workhouse. Uh, not at this point with uh, amidst COVID. Uh, when you saw the uprising of the detainees, not once, not twice, but three times, uh, originally when they first uh, just totally took over the entire unit, they said, until you move some of us out of here and move us to the workhouse uh, so that we can have social distancing and not uh, risk uh, contracting COVID from our cellmates, uh, we will not uh, back down. So they did what they needed to do to stay safe. Uh, it is unreasonable and immoral to uh, still move forward with closing the workhouse amidst the, you know, the, uh, what we're seeing with COVID. Look, COVID has affected every human being on planet Earth, right? So <laughs> certainly it's going to affect uh, the people in the workhouse. Uh, and it's something that we need to, uh, you know, continue to review. I think the director of corrections has done a, a great job in giving us all the information we need uh, moving forward. And he's done a good job of working to assure that, uh, that the inmates do have social distancing and, uh, and weeding people out so that we have, we have people now down at, at uh, the workhouse. So. So I support that effort, and I think we need to review it after COVID. All right. Thank you all for that. I'm going to bring in Rachel. I think uh, we're just so you know, it's kind of flying by. We're about halfway through our the hour that we scheduled. Uh, Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Casey. I have one last question, I think, before we move on to some of the other big issues facing the city. Uh, the phrase to fund the police gets thrown around a lot when it comes to discussions about public safety reform, uh, fiscal reform. I want to ask each one of you, what does that phrase mean to you and how will it be part of your public safety plan? Alderwoman Spencer, we'll start with you one minute. Sure. Uh, Rachel, I think that we all know, um, even the police know that we can't police our way into a safer community. Um, you know, but we also can't do this without um, our police. We need law enforcement to be able to respond immediately when lives are in re at risk, when your home is being burglarized, when um, you know when you have a carjacking, or just like a few weeks ago, a young woman was gunned down and shot in front of her children in front of her home, just a few blocks from my house. Uh, we need to have police officers who are able to respond. Um, rather than defunding the police, I think we need to recenter our conversation on policies uh, related to public safety that are more than just about policing. And that include, for example, uh, human well-being and the health and wellness of our society and our community. Uh, I am in favor of expanding the cops and clinician program, the behavioral net uh, uh, health network uh, that is putting graduates to, you know, social workers to work right now, addressing the needs of our community. Uh, but we, we have to be able to respond to dangerous situations um, and we have to be able to respond quickly. And that means uh, making sure that we do have funding for that in place. Thank you, Alderwoman. Treasurer Jones, uh, your response. Uh, what does defund the police mean to you and how will it be part of your public safety strategy? Well, voters across the city are telling me that our current system is not working. And let me ask your viewers, do you think that our current system is working? You know, calls to defund the police have echoed from every city in America following the tragic deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and many others. This is about restructuring our public safety budget and putting the public back in public safety. So I've also been advocating for social workers in the police department since 2017. And I'm glad to see that the cops and clinicians program is starting to work and start and start they 
started uh, they're up and running. Uh, but I take that a step further. It's about deploying the right professional to the right call and staffing our public safety department to make sure that as we deploy people to emergency calls, that we are deploying the right professional to the right call. And public safety is everything that makes you safe in your home and in your neighborhood. Thank you, Treasurer Jones. Mr. Jones, your response. What does defund the police mean to you and how is it part of your overall plan? It's another red herring, another talking point that's utilized to blame and scapegoat police from doing their very effective jobs. If you look at what happens with defund police, Minneapolis, who was first at trying to get this done, has now rescinded it. They're now at putting forth and allocating $6.4 million into their police budget because it failed across the board. Again, I get paid to solve problems and defunding the police, a police force that we're saying is now undermanned. It doesn't have the training budget is what I hear. So if you're gonna take money from them, that only exacerbates it and makes it worse. So I'm wondering where the thinking is relative to this, other than there has to be some type of concerted effort to disparage the police. The police do a phenomenal job. When they have leadership in front of them, you eliminate everything. You hold everyone accountable across the board. You make sure that there's no levels of discrimination for any uh, constituency and you move forward. Thank you, Mr. Jones. President Reed, your response. Uh, cities need a well-functioning, well-financed, uh, well-trained police department. St. Louis City is no different. We need a well-functioning, well-financed, and well-trained police department. Our citizens uh, deserve it, and we require it. Look at the number of murders that happened last year. We're not going to get to the bottom of all those murders by defunding the police department. When we look at some of the things that we're already doing, uh, thanks to Mayor Lida Cruson for bringing forth uh, cops and clinicians. I was really happy to work with her and we were able to get that funded. So now that's in place in the city of St. Louis. She also worked with me to put in place Cure Violence. So now Cure Violence is out in neighborhoods across the city of St. Louis. Those things are things that help with public safety but not just through the uh, through uh, the police department. So we are working to fund some things to to put some of these innovative programs in place, and I think it's helping. Okay, thank you. All. I think uh, let's switch gears just a little bit to uh, the issue that just like public safety uh, runs throughout all of life in St. Louis right now, and that is the pandemic. Uh, I've been trying to keep score here, so I think it's it's time we start uh, with Tashara Jones, Treasurer Jones, uh, with this question. We, again, we'll try to do one minute each, and we'll follow up with some discussion if it warrants. Um, what can the mayor, if anything, what could the mayor of St. Louis be doing to get St. Louisans vaccinated quicker? Uh, yes, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that uh, we need to uh, partner more with other uh, organizations that actually deliver direct care because our health department does currently does not and has not delivered direct care in years. So that means partnering with our FQHCs, partnering with St. Louis County's health department uh, and making sure that we stand up vaccination clinics so everyone who wants a vaccine can get it uh, in a timely fashion and a place that's convenient for them. Sticking with the rotation, Mr. Jones. Well, one thing- How could the mayor help in the vaccination fight? Uh, help in the vaccination fight is to follow the guideline prov provided by the federal government, the state government, and we build coalitions as best as possible. I'm submitting under my leadership, I can build those levels of coalition where they will not dismiss us out of hand because they look at us as a city that's dysfunctional and we have to build those types of relationship. We also must take into consideration that it is a reality, but there is something that can be done, particularly when you have people that trust the administration is about business, fiduciary responsibility and overall responsibility is a reflection of how you build coalitions. And that's what you do at that particular point in time. But we will follow the guidelines and the science and we'll also get our businesses back up and running as well. President Lewis Reed, uh, same question to you. What would you be doing? Uh, is there anything you could do as mayor to help us get vaccinated? Well, part of what we've done already was to pass the $88 million bill through the Board of Aldermen. That's helpful. That gets some relief to people. But 
on the vaccination side, we're going to have to get the state moving. Uh, part of our challenge here in the city of St. Louis is that we lag behind nearly every other state in the union. So we're going to have to get our federal delegation in tax our, so that they help us to push uh, for the state of Missouri to get the vaccinations. We also need to work with other like cities across the state to pressure the state so that we actually get the vaccination sent to us. Then when we get them, we need a plan in, in place. So I would build a task force, a COVID-19 task force to coordinate between all nonprofits and all uh, healthcare entities across the city of St. Louis to establish a mass, uh, mass uh, site. We can even use the dome, for example. We can set up a mass site within the dome to begin to give the vaccinations to people all throughout the region. So we need to begin to do some of those things and think outside of the box because we are the core of the region here in the city of St. Louis. Thank you, sir. Alderwoman Kara Spencer. Thanks, Casey. Well, we saw the federal government fail to develop a plan under, under the previous administration. The state is failing us. We're at the bottom of the rollout list nationally, and therefore so much of this is left to the cities. Um, and the mayor has a major role in this. First of all, we need a plan and clear communication. Where do you go? Where do you sign up? And how do we get that information in the communities most impacted? And we know that is, uh, you know, when it comes to most impacted, the uh, Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans are dying three times the rate of white Americans of COVID. So if we don't vaccinate these populations most at risk, we're going to see even more disproportional deaths. So first and foremost, we need a plan. Uh, we need communication. Look more uh, outside of just website. We need that phone number to be in the hands of communities who are most impacted, and we need to be vaccinating on a large scale. We saw St. Louis County doing mass vaccinations, um, and the city needs to join force. We, yesterday or this morning, uh, we saw the county announcing mobile vaccination units. The mayor of the city of St. Louis should be, we should be initiating similar processes to be flexible and nimble to make sure that those vaccines can meet people where they are. President Reid mentioned in his answer the uh, allocations that have already been received by the uh, city of St. Louis from the federal government. And I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Jones, we'll start with you first. Would you change the way that all the city is using the federal relief funds it has received? Well, the specificity of how it's being utilized is not just open to everyone in the public, so it's rel relatively difficult to get what their plan, because again, what I've been critical of the city of St. Louis about is that they don't have plans for anything. We'll talk about plans now, and they pejoratively call me the plan man because I'm always saying that we need plans and it has to be thorough and comprehensive. So now everyone's saying about we need plans now. Again, I also understand the purview of power that's available. The purview of power in trying to force the federal government, the state government to do something, has been shown by the city of St. Louis reaching out and they have not been responsive. That says something that absolutely imprints on what a city is capable of doing and whether or not, again, we're having smoke and mirrors talking about grandiose ideas, but the thing that we need to do more than anything is to make sure when we get our information, we move forward. I couldn't hear you, Rachel. Alderwoman Spencer, how would you have spent the federal allocation that we did receive differently, if at all? Sure. Yes. I mean, and this did go through the special committee appropriated by the president of the board. Um, you know, I think that, you know, it's important that those most impacted by COVID-19, um, the small business owners, the individuals, those renters who are on, who lost their jobs, who are unable to pay rent and homeowners who are unable to make their mortgage payments, those most impacted should be at the table driving those decisions. So, you know, we need to convene a, a, a stakeholder group to make sure that when we're rolling these out, they're done so and a much more uh, efficient manner. We have heard time and time again that the recipients receiving, you know, those folks applying for rent assistance are seeing a lot of hurdles. Uh, we need to make sure that the city uh, is doing that in a much more efficient manner, guided by not those in political office, but those most uh, directly impacted by the COVID uh, crisis. Treasurer Jones, how would you differently, if at all, be spending the allocation in a federal relief to the city of St. Louis? 
I agree with uh, Mr. Jones in that we have not seen uh, any sort of transparency with how uh, how the funds have been spent. There There is a, parent, a transparency portal uh, that doesn't get updated uh, very frequently. So we don't know how, uh, how currently funds are being spent. Um, one of the things I would have definitely done differently is the uh, tiny home village that was set up uh, just outside of downtown. It has high barriers to entry uh, for those who are trying to get access to uh, temporary uh, shelter. Uh, we need to work with our continuum of care who, uh, to make sure that we are taking care of our unhoused and our most vulnerable, uh, but also uh, we need to bring uh, more people to the table when making these decisions on uh, on how we spend our, our COVID relief dollars. Um, I personally, I would have brought uh, all of the citywides and, and aldermen to the table uh, because they know their wards better than I do. Um, and also other citywides know of other uh, uh, things that are going on in the city better than I do and we should uh, make decisions uh, um, uh, accordingly, but also. Right. Thank you, Treasurer Jones. It's absolutely some wonderful information there about bringing in uh, individuals and, and communities. President Reed, to you last, is there anything that you would have done differently in terms of allocating the federal money that the uh, city of St. Louis received? Uh, first, Rachel, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, the Board of Aldermen full meetings and every subcommittee meeting is streamed live on YouTube. So any of the discussions surrounding any of these board bills or measures that we've taken up at the Board of Aldermen, uh, anyone can get on online and see those. Uh, if you would like to testify in front of a committee, uh, you can send information in and the committee chairman can work with you. But as to the last uh, bank of COVID funding, we, we sent $5.4 million uh, of our CARES Act funding to, um, to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to be able to help with rental and mortgage assistance program. And the other thing that we've done is during the course of, of, of business, if we find that we need additional money moved to, to another pot, we will do that. So we were able to move an additional million and a half dollars to small businesses because we found that more small businesses had applied for relief funding. That All right, thank you, President that. Reed. We're gonna have to move on a little bit here. I think we'll, we'll transfer a little bit now in the time that we have left from some specific topics about the city to just kind of in general how you would run the city if you were elective mayor. And we have gotten multiple questions from viewers about relationships between the city and the county. And I'll ask all of you, starting with uh, Alderwoman Spencer, should the city be a part of St. Louis County and in what way? Oh, the St. Louis city and county question is so important, Rachel. And this is a question for the entire statistic, you know, the entire region. Uh, we have got to work together as a broader community. If we're going to position St. Louis, the broader community for growth, we have stagnated for far too long. Four decades, in fact, we have failed to grow. And that means a, a gentle slide westward of our, of our population and a hollowing out of our city. If elected mayor, I have a relentless commitment to working with our regional leaders. Um, and as such, um, you know, I joined the St. Louis Municipal League. I'm on the executive board there representing the largest muni, St. Louis City, the first representative in 100 years out there to help build those relationships. When the city of St. Louis focuses economic development strategy, not exclusively, but significantly on privatizing our airport, we did so without communicating with the regional leadership. And this was a huge failure on the part of our city leadership in developing a broader approach to one of our region's biggest assets. If we're gonna grow, we have to collaborate, coordinate, and we have to have a regional approach to driving that growth. Thank you, Alderwoman Spencer. President Reed, should the city of St. Louis be part of St. Louis County and in what way? Well, I think that uh, I think that the bigger challenge is for St. Louis County to figure out what they want to do. They have 90 some odd municipalities and they can't come together out there. So I think that that's one of the bigger issues. Uh, when you look at the city of St. Louis, at the end of all of it, we are going to have have to address our own issues ourselves. We're gonna to have to address our crime issues. We're gonna to have to address our infrastructure issues. Now there are benefits that we can gain by working together. 
And we can enter into uh, cooperative agreements today to do some of those things. We can enter into a cooperative agreements to work together uh, related to our health departments. We can enter into cooperative agreements to, uh, to share in resources uh, for our police academies. We can enter into cooperative agreements for a whole host of things, and we should, and because we can operate more efficiently and more effectively when we do that. All right. Thank you, President Reed. Mr. Jones, should the city of St. Louis be a part of St. Louis County? And if so, in what way? Well, each city has its right to its own autonomy. What we want to be able to do is build collaborative relationships. We want to be cooperative with everyone. This is a metropolitan statistical area. And I sit on boards on the Illinois side that certainly embraces that concept of doing things regionally together. That is not the problem. What I'm submitting is that the majority of the problems that we have in building those levels of coalition is because of the challenges that exist within the city of St. Louis. I submitted last time, we're in a courting period, and right now we're not, not looking that good to others to want to date and to move forward with a possible marriage. But with the right leadership, the right ability to think and coordinate, you can solve those problems. Those are minuscule problems relative to the major problems that St. Louis has we get our act together, everyone will knock on our door to be collaborative with us. Thank you, Mr. Jones and uh, Treasurer Jones, uh, to you. Should the city be a part of the county and if so, in what way? So I see uh, this whole question about a uh, city county, uh, a city county merger as an elephant and how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Uh, we started the freeholders process and didn't get to have the conversation because the city didn't uh, appoint its uh, nine freeholders. Uh, we need to revisit that conversation, but I think that we should do uh, multiple freeholders processes uh, to uh, to talk about the multiple problems uh, within our region. So one uh, dedicated to the health department, one to public safety, another to education. Uh, and so we, we will be uh, used to having this conversation um, and everybody will start thinking about regionalism, um, um, and, and we'll do it over a period of years. And I'm also fortunate enough to be endorsed by County Executive Sam Page and uh, Prosecuting Attorney Wesley Bell and look forward to working with them uh, to, to address the problems of our region because they don't just stop at Skinker Boulevard or the Mississippi River. Thank you all. Let's stick with the questions we've had from our listeners and our viewers. Uh, we've had quite a few about transportation and various questions, but they all kind of touch on Metrolink. Uh, Dennis reminded us that back in 2017, we actually passed a sales tax uh, for Metrolink. Uh, Rachel looked this up earlier today. It's somewhere north of $30 million that we have in this uh, this account that was, that's being collected from that sales tax. So I want to know, what should we be doing with that money? Do you think Metrolink expansion is what we should be focused on as a region? If so, why? Or if something else, why? Um, let's see. I will start with Treasurer Jones, please. Yes, absolutely. The hallmark of any growing city is the public transit that it offers its citizens and its visitors. Uh, and St. Louis, we have not expanded uh, public transit in years. And yes, so we should absolutely uh, look at how, how much money we have already saved through the uh, sales tax that we've collected, but also partner uh, with St. Louis County and St. Clair County uh, to see what, uh, what routes that uh, should be expanded. As treasurer, I put $2 million towards the uh, update of the North-South Metrolink study uh, and look forward to uh, working with uh, County Executive Sam Page to expand the North-South line and also working with my friends on the federal level uh, should uh, transportation dollars start becoming available, we are ready to apply um, and make sure that we can uh, get this project started again. Mr. Jones. The exp expansion problem was looked into and the monies that was allocated through the taxes, other monies, and looking at the RF, R, RFQ relative to it wasn't enough. It needs a whole lot more money in plain English. So until such time comes where some federal monies come, we should table it. We should have the money utilized in a fiscally responsibility area and be fiduciary responsible that we don't tap into the money for other things, not put it into general funds because things like that happen in the city of St. Louis. We have to be responsible, but we also need to get data, more information to determine 
whether or not the expansion is absolutely necessary because ridership's down. It's dangerous on the on the light rail, even on the bi-state buses. They're dangerous and that's unfortunate as well. So there's some other things that we need to show up on the baseline of public transportation but before we start expanding to places where it won't be utilized by the people. President, President Reed. Uh, there's always benefit into expanding public transportation, especially when you look at some of the marginalized communities across the city of St. Louis. We know that development and investment hand, uh, happens along transportation corridors. It also happens along broadband corridors. And in this case, you can put both in place. We need to really work with the Biden administration and also push our state. We get virtually no funding from the state related to uh, light rail. If we would have taken the position uh, at the beginning when we first started looking at Metrolink that said, OK, it's too expensive. Let's just not do it. We wouldn't have it today. Uh, and the fact of the matter is cities that invested early on in in, you know, transportation, uh, alternative transportation, like light rail, they have exceeded and have grown beyond cities who haven't. So it's very important that we continue to look at it. Uh, we, we continue to work with various different partners and look at ways to close the gap. Thank you, sir. Alderwoman Spencer. Sure. The North-South Metrolink is a great idea, and the treasure's right. We need a high-quality transit system to be a growing, uh, a successful city. We are collecting uh, about uh, 10 million, a oh, little over $10 million a year, um, but this is a $1 billion project. So we're collecting essentially 1% a year. Uh, even with a 50% federal match, we'd be paying for that expansion for 50 years. So if elected mayor, I'd pivot this incredibly important conversation and do two things. One, I'd increase safety on our existing line and our existing public transit systems. And number two, I would I would change the conversation from a light rail to a more nimble bus rapid transit system. And looking at some of the cities who are leading in that effort, uh, recognizing that transit in general is shifting underneath our feet with driverless cars in ways that we can't even imagine right now. So we need to be positioned for uh, flexibility uh, and nimbleness in our uh, public transit expansion, and most importantly, fiscally responsible, fiscally feasible. Okay, we are just about out of time. I'm gonna end with one question I've been assured none of you will answer, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. Uh, one week from today, voters, this is the primary. They can vote for as many of you as they want, and then the top two vote getters will move on to the primary. If you're not one of those two top vote getters, who would you want your voters to support? I'll just go back in reverse order, Alderwoman Spencer. Sure. You know, um, I have to say it has been exceptionally difficult to work with president of the board at the Board of Aldermen. And the board is run like a circus in so many ways. Um, you know, and I have to say that I really overlap in policies with uh, Treasurer Tashara Jones in many fronts. And so, um, you know, I will leave that to voters. I'm grateful that none of us know in one individual gets to select the next mayor. But uh, given those constraints, <laughs> you know, I'll say that, Casey. Um, Thank, uh, thank you. Thank I you for support the thank, treasurer on that front. Thank you for your answer. Uh, President Reed. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, all the woman Kara Spencer just cannot uh, help herself but to spew hate. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, um, the un unfortunate thing, she has done the same thing at the Board of Aldermen, which is why she is such a divisive figure, which is why you don't don't see not one African-American alderman supporting her because she's been so divisive in that way. It's that type of divisive leadership that we cannot afford in our city. Cities are being divided. All
have Mr. Gotten, President, have, I run okay, my own campaign. Okay. Side, okay. So. Thank you. Thank you both. Mr. Jones, quickly, sir. Uh, the, I'm going to end with one question. I've been assured none of you will answer, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Uh, one week from today, voters, this is the primary. They can vote for as many of you as they want. And then the top two vote getters will move on to the primary. If you're not one of those two top vote getters, who would you want your voters to support? I'll just go back in reverse order, Alderwoman Spencer. Sure. You know, um, I have to say it has been exceptionally difficult to work with president of the board at the Board of Aldermen. And the board is run like a circus in so many ways. Um, you know, and I have to say that I really overlap in policies with uh, Treasurer Tashara Jones in many fronts. And so, um, you know, I will leave that to voters. I'm grateful that none of us know in one individual gets to select the next mayor. But uh, given those constraints, <laughs> you know, I'll say that, Casey. Um, Thank, uh, thank you. Thank I you for support the treasurer you. on that front. Thank you for your answer. Uh, President Reed. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, all the woman Kara Spencer just cannot uh, help herself but to spew hate. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, um, the un unfortunate thing, she has done the same thing at the Board of Aldermen, which is why she is such a divisive figure, which is why you don't, don't see not one African-American alderman supporting her because she's been so divisive in that way. It's that type of divisive leadership that we cannot afford in our city. Cities are being divided already all across this nation. And if we have a, yet, yet another divisive, angry figure in place, we will just go, we, I mean, we will just be moving light years backwards. I don't uh, wanna be rude, but we are coming up close. So I'll get, okay. to give you five seconds to wrap it up and then we'll go to Mr. Jones. All right, so so for me, there is absolutely no way that I would ever be able to, to support uh, someone that would be that divisive in our city. It would be irresponsible. The board is operating more efficiently and effective as it, than it ever has been. Okay. But because of her campaign managers, Jim Shrewsbury, who I've defeated, and Vince Shamo, those two have Mr. got- Mr. President, have, I run okay. my own okay. campaign. Side, okay, so. thank you. Thank you both. Mr. Jones, quickly, sir, uh, the question was, would just throw your support behind anyone else if you're not one of the two that make it through? Well, my primary focus right now, and as well as all the others, is to utilize my campaign, something like that. I will certainly take into consideration after this is over. I believe that each candidate, even if I disagree with them wholeheartedly, I believe each one believes that they have an answer. I just disagree with uh, some people more than others, and I wish everyone luck, but I'm hoping that the city will utilize me and vote for me to move into the next round and eventually become mayor. I wish everyone luck. Thank you. Treasurer Jones, the last word to you on an awkward question that I started. Uh, thank you, Casey. Uh, look, I, I do believe that I'm the best candidate, and if I didn't, I wouldn't be running. Uh, but I have had a long friendship with uh, President Lewis Reed. Uh, we went, we go way back to working uh, at People's Health Centers uh, uh, under the late, great Betty Jean Kerr. Um, and I know that at his heart, uh, he, uh, he is... Uh, he definitely uh, is putting this, the city first. Uh, so I would support Lewis Reed if I if 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 I didn't make it through. Well, and I thank you all for your for all record, of your candid I'd answers. Support Tashara Jones. Okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate right. it. Right. Uh, let's get it uh, out on time by throwing it back to Ruth. Rachel, thank you, and thank you to all of you candidates. Ruth, back to you. I want to thank the candidates for participating in our debate and the panelists from our debate partners, Casey Nolan from Five on Your Side and Rachel Lippman from St. Louis Public Radio. The St. Louis mayoral primary election is next Tuesday, March 2nd. For 9PBS, I'm Ruthie Zell. Thanks for joining us.